No, no. Hey, this is Dr. Paul Dyer. Welcome to Bridges Live. And uh, this is a pretty neat, special interview or conversation because, you know, I like to have conversations. But we've been, we've known each other for a long time. You got to say the years. I can't well, do since, that math. Well, since junior high. Mm-hmm. We went but to the same the, junior high. Did you say the year? <laughs> You can say the year. It's like around 1982 Two. Right. Yeah. So, we've known. And, yeah. But that's not why I want to have this conversation. Today's Thanksgiving, which is even, to me, I think it's even more special. Almost like, it's not that it's a Thanksgiving special or anything like that, but you've gone through, like we were talking before, how our lives have been intertwining for a long time. Mm-hmm. And here I am sitting in this beautiful home, um, your family's home, Thanksgiving, and our lives have come back together, and families are joining, and all this. It's it's amazing. Yeah, it's nice. But your journey has been quite special, too. Mm -hmm. You're out and in, expanding and contracting, and and you just did a special, because you do yoga in Brooklyn. Yes, I have a yoga studio in Brooklyn. So... After all of it's all been, how did you get to yoga? Because we we both talk about energy and space and how life life is giving and living, but we have to be a participant in it. Yes, that's true. And you came to that realization after you were sick or before you, because you got sick. Yes. Um, well, I mean, I found yoga, basically it was not wanting to be in the gym anymore. I had an art practice that was daily, and a friend of mine just knew I didn't want to be in the gym anymore and said, you know, you probably like this yoga thing. Come take a class. <laughs> so it's just like, hey, come on over. Come take a class. And I knew people who practice yoga seemed that they did it all the time. They were very committed, and I wasn't yeah, sure I wanted to be that committed. Yeah, they have a thing. They, it's, it's very... Um not clickish. That's not the word I'm gonna look for. It's very um, it, it, it's it's it is very inclusive. Yeah. People who do yoga, like I do yoga, mm-hmm. you don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like it's you and us. And yoga is supposed to be about opening. And well, about, and it is. Yes. You know, so there are people who have a practice, and there are people who are just like they do it. It's a physical. Thing. Exercise. Yeah. You know, and neither are right or wrong. It just it depends on who you are. Um, and for me, pretty early on, it became a spiritual thing because it connected right away my art practice. How so? I mean... Um, my uh, Technically, I'm an abstract painter, even though now I've been working in denim. But working in paint, my work was very fluid and layered. So the walking back and forth to the canvas... Um, was meditative, but also the, you know, making the gestures is movement. It's very much movement. So between the meditativeness and making the gestures movement, um, yoga just seemed to make sense. Um, and, it, you know, the breathing aspect tied everything together that um, helped to reduce stress. Most people never even... I, I know when I do education to holistic education most people don't forget about the breathing they know breathing is a part of it Mm -hmm. but they don't know that's a vibration part of it they don't know how it much it moves the body internally that it does working externally well you know we forget how to breathe after we're basically babies um for a lot of different reasons whether it's stress or you know, we want to look good with a flat belly, so we forget <laughs> that we actually need to breathe move, yeah, move and get oxygen into the brain. <laughs> um, you know, so our functions end up being compromised. And when you do actually start to move with the breath, things do happen in the body that allow for better health movement and less stress and relaxation. I was just, I teach these young kids, and I was saying these five-year-olds, and, and I have them repeat it, all things are moved with breath Mm -hmm. and they they repeat it you know because we want them to consciously know it subconsciously understand it and then to them physically do it so there's this process Mm -hmm. that you got to keep them doing right tell us about when you got sick and how'd you find out um literally i went to 
doctor. It was, you know, my list of doctor's appointments that I was going through. I kind of tried to schedule them all at a certain same time of the year. So it was just the last Because the one reason why I'm list. asking is because you, you've now, you is it part of the practice or you've dedicated your practice to this specific? No, not at all. I mean, I was lucky to have had a practice at that time and understood for me the benefit of practicing so that when I did get my diagnosis, um, you know, and right away when you, you know, you get a diagnosis, that's stress. So I stopped breathing in the moment, even though I knew I was supposed to still breathe. The stress of that. What was the diagnosis? Um, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. They didn't know until um, after that it was stage two, which means that it moved. Um, it was just on my right side, right breast, and I had a lymph node that had cancer, and the rest that they checked out did not have cancer. So it was stage two diagnosis. My mother had cancer. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Right. It's not something, I guess, right. at, our, at our youthful age, we don't go to school and say, man, my mother had her breast removed, mm -hmm. and she's, she's got cancer, and, and so, and she was diagnosed with, with her cancer, and then she was taking all these medication, and then they had gave her only two years to live. And what year was this? This was junior high. Okay. So, yeah, it was a long time ago. Right. So, they gave her two years to live. At that time, um, one of her friends came in and said, um, Wilbert, my mom's name, and they said, I'm going to take you to this clinic in Alabama. Mm -hmm. It was naturopathic clinic. That was my, my first induction into natural health because it took... Every it took all those pills away from my mom. Mm -hmm. The only pills that she let now we can't when she stayed down there, so it was just me and my brother in the house all by ourselves. Mm -hmm. I don't think you could do that now. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think people go to jail now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think they'd be like, okay, what was that house number again? However, you turned out very fine. You were fine. You know, everything's okay. But when she came back, no more cancer. Because even though they removed her breast, she was still having these um, masses grow. And it, it turned out, she realized from understanding what natural health was doing to her, that her stress, her body was creating mm -hmm. this cancerous tumors. Interesting. And the toxic mm -hmm. part of her life was creating these it tumors. Yeah. Right. And that's how she... Um, realized that she could stop the cancer that's how we turned into natural health and that's how that's where my line extends from i always loved health things and people mm -hmm. but that's why i do what i do now because i know what our bodies can do and what it has done for my mother until she died at the age of 89 oh, wow. right mm -hmm. so where these western doctors were like oh yeah you're gonna die yeah and and having us go through my mother pulling out these papers, going, okay, when I die, mm -hmm. this is what you need to do. This is what you need to do. This right. is what you need to do. With that, especially young age. Right. And then, you know. And then it didn't. It need didn't to happen. So for you, when you got diagnosed, this is again, again, this whole little thing that we keep spiraling in and out of our lives together. How I hit with you, and then you, your 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 life is really saving you, and you're saving lives. So, um, I, when I got my diagnosis, I had actually owned the yoga studio a um, couple years, and so I had been practicing and teaching for a long time, but when you get that diagnosis right away, it's like you immediately think, yes, death is there. what's happening, yeah. and this is what it is. Um, and they had said to me that based on what I, we had decided would be my treatment plan, which was, even though the cancer was on my right side... I opted for a double mastectomy because I, A, wanted to be, you know, I wanted to go back to my life the way that I like my life to be. Your life. My life. I like summertime, you know, being in bathing suit, you know, I just wanted balance. But also, you know, my family lost my sister two years before I got my diagnosis. So it was just my sister and I growing up. So for my family, for my parents, I was just like, they cannot lose another one. Another one. So I was like, we're going to do the most radical thing to ensure 
that like my life goes on and gets back to what it had been. Now, one of the things I, I when I ask about like Bridges Live and and I think I mentioned this to you before how I want our testimonies help with lives, right? Mm -hmm. I know we can't tell someone else what to, what they should do, could do, because they have to find that voice inside themselves. Okay. In retrospect, what voice was talking to you to say, I'm going to do this? Was it for you? Was it for them? Or was it for all? It was for all. Okay. Like it was all. Like I would say my family unit, for yeah. my whole family, and the life that I had, the life that I wanted to continue. So that was, I guess I made the choice for my family and myself. Um, and then when I did make that decision, um, you know, I was talking to my second opinion doctors because I had my first doctor that I saw who went from, we caught it early, this is really good, mm. it's our job to take care of you, went from that to, like, not answer my questions in that same setting, you know, because, well, he was talking about, like, what my options were, and he went from, like, it's small, we, literally, he wanted to schedule him back to me. And literally was picking up the phone to schedule, you know, try to schedule that surgery. You know, I was like, I haven't talked to my family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're just yeah. And then he's like, well, let's also talk about your other options. And right away, went to talking about mastectomy. And I'm like, how do we go from we thought it early? <laughs> <laughs> like, I just, I couldn't make that leap and didn't understand it. And he... And he's evil can evil. Yeah. He's, he's jumping. You he's know, like, let's just, let's just go. Right. right. <laughs> you know, like, your number. Let me just schedule this thing. And I was just like, now I don't trust you. Yeah. Because I don't. Because I, I don't. And I don't trust having this conversation with you. And I certainly don't trust you cutting my body open. So I asked for my charts. And he said, do you want a second opinion? And I said, yes, I do. And then I went to another hospital. And right away, they looked at me. And they're like, why are you here? Um, and also, I didn't have health insurance. So they were like, how does somebody who does not have health insurance have a medical file this thick? Um, I was in this program where I was basically teaching yoga at a hospital um, in exchange for health care credits. So, and as a person who's wanting to be healthy and yeah. being in charge of my health, I was going to my doctor's appointments and everything. So right away they were like, let us help you. You know, like you don't look like most of the people who come in here. Um, and they really like... Not, not being black. You're talking about just... just uh, well, and <laughs> <laughs> in like <laughs> every box, check, 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 check. Um, you're you not our just don't look person like you know, a person that comes that to comes you. And like, let us help you. You know, and right away it was like, they're looking at me and not me as a number and not as... You know, I mean, cancer is huge and it doesn't discriminate. Yeah. So there are a lot of people who... I just diagnosed and a lot of people who have not really had health as a priority in their lives so that when things do happen why do you think that is I mean I mean I think it, it's, it's a lot of reasons there's a, there's there there's a multitude of reasons mm -hmm. what's one you think that you that you, that jumps out at you education I, I, I can we shoot that in the in the uh, like can we kill that horse? We we keep saying education, 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 and yet every time we come to a situation, we like people say, how, how did you, you know, what what made you understand? It? You know, I finally got the education. So obviously, well, when like, I say that it's broad, so it's like education about physical health, mm -hmm. about your own physical body, listening to it. Listening to it, understanding that it's a thing. Yeah, it's it's and like it it's breathes, it lives. Like you know, when we're kids and everybody likes to run, when you're children, there's at some point where it's like either you don't like gym class, or it's not an you know that's not a positive experience for you. Who was that junior high school gym teacher? Um, it was we had, we had two. Yeah, there was a woman. There was the, the evil woman, and <laughs> and. I don't remember. I, remember. <laughs> I think more high school, wasn't it? Mr. Sachs is one. Mr. Sachs is one, but I played football and yeah. you were in the cheerleading. And yeah, he was nice. And yeah, and football players didn't have to do gym. But we, well, we didn't because what happened was he wanted all of his football players to have first like early morning gym so we can use that as film. Oh, oh, see, I had no idea that that yeah. happened. Yeah. Interesting. 
And after football season, we didn't have to go to gym. And because per Mr. Garber, our vice, our, our vice principal, who was really technically the principal, uh-huh. but he had, you know, without the title. Because he ran the school. Uh-huh. Mr. Garber. You yeah. were more in on all of that stuff than me. I was just going to class. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You and Janine. Always in class. Always in class. <laughs> or in the art room. I always did a lot of artwork. You and Larry Davis. Yes. Yes. You know, have, you, have you been in touch with Larry? Absolutely. Hello, Larry, Larry is the godfather of my first move. Oh, gosh. Good for Larry. Hey, Larry. Yeah. You can say hello, Larry. He listens Hi, Larry. to the, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. High school was fun. I liked it. He's one of the best tattoo artists in the country. Oh, really? I have to come. I need a new one. Yeah. Yeah. I, he is absolutely uh, outstanding. It's, it's fascinating, uh, him going all over the world and the way he... Uh, the request and it's, it's like, you know. Okay, I have to look Larry up. I actually yeah. do want a new tat. <laughs> yeah, I'm, we're all ready for another one too. Yeah, good. We can have a party and just go and like have Larry just do us all. Do us all. Uh huh. It's not like he hasn't done it before. And be all fun. my daughters have had. Oh and, really? Yeah. Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's touched all of my daughters and tattoo and tattoo her. That's awesome. Yeah. That's great. Um, yeah, I think. There is a physical aspect, like that relation. It's like any relationship, right? It's like if you are afraid of math when you're young, mm-hmm. that means math is scary for you, and you're probably not going to do well in math unless you have that teacher that just figures out how to reach you so that that's not traumatic any longer. So I think that there's a similar thing with physical activity. If you're not a person who's into sports when you're younger, mm-hmm. you're not into like moving your body. You know, maybe you're a dancer, so it's like you're not maybe doing gym, but you're in dance class. So there is some physical awareness that you have for your body, so that when you're not moving or something happens in your life where that's sort of taken out of the equation, something happens that doesn't feel right for you, so you seek it out. Um, Education-wise, in terms of, I mean, just even understanding that that is important. Um, I've always been a person like to move, likes to move. So that's always been part of my life. Life is movement. Mm-hmm. Life is about all kinds of movement. You know, mm-hmm. love is a movement. You know, mm-hmm. kindness is a movement. Compassion is a movement. Knowing that, having that internal compassion, love, and kindness for yourself, we don't con- we don't connect that to. No, I mean, and that too is like a huge lesson Mm -hmm. and an educational path that sometimes takes years to realize um so is that what you give your students at personal love care like this is about love care self-care yeah i mean i you know again i've been practicing yoga for quite a while and you know came into it sort of for the physical practice even though the the meditation Mm -hmm. aspect resonated with me right away but through practice, and I guess, you know, once I really started finding myself as a, te- uh, as a teacher, um, understanding that there are eight limbs to this practice, mm-hmm. and that for me, like, that's really where I teach from, there are eight limbs. The physical practice is the third limb, so it's not the most important. It's the first close. two yeah. are the most important. And the very first one is the yamas, and that's how we treat others, it's mm-hmm. how we connect our communities, our families, all of those things that make us feel connected to the world. To, to, now, when you mean world, do you mean all the living matter, or you mean like worldly, like the rock, and not so much the rock, but most people look at the world as the car, and I look at the world as the ocean, the mountains, the rock, the trees, the all of the living matter that matters. Yeah, I think I, I think of that on two levels. Okay. I think of being connected to other people first because as we're human beings, like we're wired for connection. Mm -hmm. So there's that. And if you don't have connection to other humans, it's very isolating. And then other things start to happen that are very, say, unhealthy. Um, (laughs) But I think once you understand that relationship with other humans, it translates into the planet, to the earth, to the things that um, are just amazing around us. Recently, you were just, how would you say it, found, how would you put the Good Morning oh, show? Oh, the Good Morning America spot. Um, 
through Yoga for Cancer that I'm connected with. I do some work for, and I teach a yoga class specifically for um, cancer survivors and their caretakers. So when you say Yoga for Cancer, how is how is that directed differently than a different a regular yoga class? Right, yeah, like what is the split? Um, in a in a Y for C, a Yoga for Cancer class, there's no downward facing dog. The sequencing is much different than you would find in a regular yoga class. Okay. And the reason for the difference is that you have people who are either in treatment or just out of treatment, who are either you know post surgery, maybe they're um, you know in the midst of their chemo radiation treatment, so they might have chemo ports in, they might still have um, surgical scars are still healing. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, after my surgeries, my range of motion was really limited. I literally could not put my hand behind my head. Um, So you don't want to be a downward facing dog. In fact, you don't want to be weight bearing on your arms. Um, You know, it's for everybody who's had any type of cancer. So if you've got tumors growing you know inside mm-hmm. somewhere you don't want to feed them with blood you don't want to be yeah you don't want to be in twists you don't you know like all of that stuff so the class is taught sort of in a broad range to be able to for any um survivor with any type of cancer in any range uh, mm-hmm. stage of their treatment to be able to come into class and feel strong and connected to their bodies again because that's one of the first things that happens that for me as somebody who likes to move to um First of all, be told that you have cancer. It's like mm-hmm. my body basically is betraying me. All of these things that I thought I was doing to be healthy didn't work or something, something. went wrong. You know, so what did you find out about the cancer cells, your particular cancer cells? Did you find out anything like, oh, or like enlightening, like your cancer cells have been you know, metastasizing like this and mm-hmm. nothing? Just No, I mean, cancer doesn't run in my family. Okay. I just was lucky and got that um, little ticket. Well, lucky you. Yeah, lucky me. <laughs> um, you know, uh, it was cancer that had been um, fed by estrogen. Uh, the first doctor that I went to that really wanted to do that lumpectomy and be done, um, it was a good thing that I did not go with that doctor because my second opinion um, team set up a, it's a 3D mammogram that I had never heard of. Never heard of until, I, I didn't hear that until someone told me about their triple, um, they had a triple, triple negative, triple negative breast, I'm like, mm-hmm. whoa. Yeah. Like I didn't hear about that until I, I had actually interviewed her. And she's she's a survivor of triple negative. So what the um, 3D um, mammogram showed was a lesion that my first team didn't see. And it was interesting because my second um, opinion team also was, you know, wanted to have an MRI. And I thought, that sounds really smart. That makes sense. I like you guys. I like what you're thinking. He's my first doctor. Um, when he actually called me back to say, okay, if you're not going to come back and see me, I just want to make sure you're being seen by someone. And I said, yes. I found some doctors that I want to work with. And just so you know, they've suggested an MRI. And this first doctor said, an MRI isn't really necessary. They do the MRI, and they find 15 more microscopic Okay, so if we go back to education, 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 I went to the doctor, said, I went to the person, whether it be for, for my health, you're, you're in this position, I'm talking to you, you, I'm seeking information from you, mm-hmm. and you don't give me all of it. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, which happens. Yeah, which happens, so now aren't we stuck with... Terry, I went for into education, and I never heard this. So, so you go to somebody, and they actually don't give you the right. full picture. Right. I mean, you know, that is a bunch of things. I was at a hospital that's not, I'd say, one of the most stellar hospitals. So Me more that. expensive? Um, <laughs> I mean, because we're stuck here. We, we, I can I mean, only honestly, go where I can go. Right, you can go where you can go. And because everybody is overwhelmed, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know how many people that doctor saw that day. Right. I don't know how right. many diagnoses he gave that day. I don't know how many he did that week. So I don't know how connected he's feeling so to here, his patient. So here's, and I think this is, you, you, you caught my frisbee because I think 
if he took connection classes, mm-hmm. yoga classes, therapeutic mindfulness classes, he would treat people differently. Yeah. He would care, hopefully, just that much better. A little bit more. Just a little mm-hmm. bit more. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where I think education needs. Mm-hmm. Not so much who's ever sick. I think it's a person that they come to, they're like, you know, you're, or a teacher, you know what I mean? Like, instead of teachers running everyone the same way, like, you're just, you're just a talkative kid, you're a bad kid. Right. Or go to the principal's office, go mm-hmm. to the, you know. Right, seeing each person as an individual person. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I think the education thing has two sides. I think as a person, you have to be somewhat cognizant of your own health. Mm. And if something doesn't feel right, something may not be right. And there is a certain part of, there's a certain amount of responsibility that's on you. And then there is a certain amount of responsibility that's on the medical side of seeing Mm. everybody as an individual person, which means you'd like to think that this person cared, cared, but that that care also, there's that person giving the care to the patient. But behind that person, there's also like what they're doing for themselves, but also what they're doing for the other people in their personal lives hmm. so that they can actually see other people as people. What's next? I mean, is this continue on the same path, move into building other things? You're happy where you are in Brooklyn? Where are you in Brooklyn? So I'm in Park Slope, okay. Brooklyn. Um, I mean, this is a huge conversation because as you're saying this now, I'm thinking, you know, I... The reason I was able to have the health care that I had in the first place, I was teaching yoga yeah. to hospital staff. I know. You know, and teaching the hospital staff, they are like they're caregivers, right? Yeah. So they're overwhelmed. The system is not working well for anyone. No. They're overworked, understaffed. So like part of that program was to alleviate some of I guess the attention costs for the hospital, right? And having people do services within the hospital to make sure certain things were actually happening because they weren't happening and that it was a win-win for everybody because people who are coming to participate in that program were getting health care. Mm-hmm. These people are actually providing services for the hospital that they weren't actually paying out of their budget. Because I taught meditation classes for cancer patients. Oh. At, mm-hmm. um, and then I knew someone who took uh, massages for cancer patients. Mm-hmm. So th- I understand that they're trying to get into these little bit of nuances to help with patients alleviate some of the stress. But there's still like a huge gap between Mm -hmm. the medical, say Western medicine, Mm -hmm. understanding that these other modalities are support. Um, You know, they're, you know, getting on that, thinking about one versus the other, I think both work in tandem quite nicely. And that's what happened with me. And I think that while I thought my body had really betrayed me, I think it actually took care of me because my bounce back was re- pretty quick. I mean, I went through, like, I'd walk in after having surgery and the women in the reception were just like, you don't look like anything happened to you when I would, you know, come in for my checkups, my follow-ups. Um, you know, originally my doctors told me that based on my surgical plan that I wouldn't have my practice back for a year. And I was like, you know, that's not really going to work for me at all, <laughs> at all, if you don't know me at all. Um, and, you know, so, you know, I, I was doing standing poses at home. And this was before, I, you know, I was practicing right up to my surgeries, but I was also practicing standing poses at home, anticipating what was going to be different after surgery. And then you go into surgery kind of wondering if you're going to feel like yourself when you come out of surgery and then we know we know i don't i don't know from a woman male we know i've heard as male women feel completely non like a woman like Mm -hmm. what made them a woman yeah i mean it is funny because that wasn't really my concern Mm -hmm. because my connection to myself as a woman is more broad than just my physical body i was more like how is terry going to feel being compromised in being able to do the things that Terry likes to do. And that's really where my head was. And I woke up for sur- from surgery and I felt like me, you know, and part of that was I had a really strong support system. I had a friend who came with me to like most of my doctor's appointments. My girlfriends really showed up for me. My parents 
came and stayed with me for five days for my surgery, and I really had this like support system um, where if you know if I hadn't had that, it would have felt really different. Mm -hmm. I think also going in, I told my staff what was happening with me, not so much um, because I really wanted to share this thing that was happening because I'm still like it was it really attacked my identity as a health how so? person how so I mean um, you know as a yoga teacher it's like I am it wasn't like you were like a health. fat yoga teacher you know what I mean <laughs> not that, not that but the guise of what healthy looks like gotcha cancer is not a healthy a healthy look necessarily I get it you know so it, you know it's like how can I still promote this thing if this is what's happening with me so I was battling with that but I told my staff basically I was going to be out for a few weeks and I didn't want anybody freaked out about my not being there mm -hmm. and I didn't want you know because if it's a big secret didn't. then all kinds of like things start to become imagined so I let everybody know what was happening and and that's really why I told them but what I got back was like this huge support that I wasn't really expecting and I wasn't seeking but it was it was a really nice surprise and I think that actually helped me also to be able to go and do this thing and also figure out for myself what it's going to mean for me later. That's funny. I think how communication really works when not so much when we speak, but how we listen and people were listening to you. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. You, you were saying what you wanted them to know, but they were listening and then they, then they responded from their heart spot. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And I think that says a lot for your staff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which was, um, like I didn't know like you don't know things until you know I mean you're inkling you know like I like these people they're great and then it's like they show you how like, great they are and that was really touching and then I had the surgery and then you know woke up feeling you know you wake up like you wake up any morning it's like okay I'm here um, the most important things are here I knew my family was in the waiting room my girlfriends were all there and they all got to talk and stuff so it's like this and it was like um, you know, any sort of... You brought people together back. around here. You bring right? people together. <laughs> you know, but at the same time, but you're not there. You're not. <laughs> you know, like, they're doing this thing. Um, like, one of my appointments, two of my friends who had met each other, they came, and I was already in. Um, I, was, I think I was going in for... I it was that mammogram or something. And so they texted me, and they're like, yeah, we're going to go to lunch. And I'm like... Hmm. You're leaving me to go to lunch. Like I'm gonna go to lunch. <laughs> you know, so it was that. Like, but, um, that. But they you wouldn't have been here. Yeah, you know, like, <laughs> like I brought you together. Like you could take me to lunch. You could wait till I'm done. We could all go to lunch. But um, that was nice. But um, looking back, like this yoga practice thing, when I woke up in the hospital, you know, feeling like me, and the nurses were like, you know, you're okay, and I was like, yeah, I feel alright. Um, and I was just like, you know, I really got to use the bathroom. And she's like, you want to get up? And I was like, of course I do. And the head nurse was like, no, she's not. I'm going to need a bedpan. So, like, literally going into bridge pose, right, knowing that I didn't want to disturb my upper body because I really didn't know how in pain I was. Right, right. Because I'm still, you know, under the anesthesia, partially. Um, so I got my body into bridge pose and, you know, did the alignment. Yep. Heels under my knees. Yep. Really used my shoulders. And lifted up, and, and it took all of my strength to do it, but I knew how to strategically get my body yeah. lined up and, you know, finish. And I was just like exhausted. And I was just like, I don't know how people do who don't know how to do that do it. can do that for themselves. So it's like, right, first thing, as basic as that is, yoga showed up for me. And then um, I was in the hospital that night and went home. And, you know, I live in Brooklyn. I live in fourth floor walk up. And I walked up four foot, like we were all standing at the bottom of the stairs. Looking like four at the friends, stairs, right, my yeah. parents and I looking at the stairs like, okay, here we go. And I walked up the stairs. Most of you people, if you, if you don't never lived in Brooklyn or New York, the, the New York City area, or when you say four floor walk up, it's a vertical up. Yes. It's not like a slope, like San Francisco. No, no but it's it is up. a hike. It's a hike. It's a hike. <laughs> Well, you know, yeah. and you know, you know, on a normal day of carrying groceries or whatever, you know, it's a workout. Yeah, but this was just me after surgery, and I didn't really know. And I literally like it was fine. 
Like, I was just like, okay, that was nothing. But then when I was home and the visiting nurses would come and I would answer the door and they would be out of breath. They're <laughs> 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 kind of looking at me a little like cross eyed. Like, yeah. you made me walk up these stairs. And I'm like, I did it after surgery. You could do it. <laughs> you know, so like things like that, um, I think helped me to again feel connected to my physical body. And then, yeah, we'd get up and kind of do some standing poses and be like, okay, you could still do that. And that helped me to feel like me. We're going to close this off, keep you here all night. We will be here all night, Tigers. Speaking of that, Mm -hmm. I'm sure the Tiger family, fans, and Spring Valley Tigers all wish you well and health. And you got a lot of response from Yeah, I did. It was really nice. From people that I hadn't seen literally since graduation. Yeah. Talking about, oh, good, good for you, congratulations, mm-hmm. and so probably. Uh, and a few other survivors out there also, which is, you know. And I think, I hope, that's what I was going to ask you, speaking to a survivor, speaking to a person who may not even know they have cancer, what do you say? Well, if you don't know, I would just say be on top of all your doctor's appointments, anything that doesn't feel right. Like, I literally felt a little lump that didn't really feel like a whole lot but Mm -hmm. I was there at the office anyway so I just asked and that turned out to be um, cancer so you never know it could be as small as anything Um, you know and catching it early was was huge Um, you know when it's not caught early things can really um, change and go downhill pretty pretty quickly I know for women it's breast cancer for men it's prostate cancer for black men it's prostate cancer even more so Mm -hmm. um and it, to me, it goes back to the awareness of your body and awareness yep. of who you are. And if you 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 can't you can't the outside noise and start listening to yourself, you start to understand what your body is, yes, not what it isn't, mm-hmm. yeah. and what it should be, and mm-hmm. not what people tell you it should be. Yeah. And it's also about like your life and what you want. Do you remember our yearbook saying? Our year what? <laughs> our, our yearbook saying. No. Not at all. I'm sorry. That's no. I'm. I, <laughs> here's. What, I thought about this when I knew it was make a difference. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I remember it. Like I, now I'm seeing the yearbook. How it went yeah. diagonally yeah. across the uh-huh. yearbook, right? Yeah. If if we had known that many years ago that. It was a corny phrase then, because I remember, I literally remember laughing. You were in the yearbook committee, wasn't I you? I know. I mean, I, the 80s was a very corny committee. <laughs> <laughs> Besides having Phil Collins as our... Um, exactly what I was thinking, but I didn't want to say that. You know, just one more night. Just one, just one right. <laughs> Make a difference, and you think about, wow, now of what you have been doing mm. is making a difference. It it, it seems like who, what a forethought that was then. But yes, then it was still corny. Now it just means something. Yeah. I mean, it was really corny. It, it was really <laughs> corny. So I would say making something really corny and turning it around, making it valid. Yeah. Um, yeah, which is nice. That's nice. That's nice. That's really nice. Because it was really corny. It was super corny. <laughs> so, um, so X amount of years later, um, turning something corny into something useful. That's pretty cool. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Paul.